help you keep yourself uh, rooted there in John 17. This morning we wrap up our series on John 17, this prayer of Jesus. And uh, next week we will um, take a significant shift in focus as we begin a series on the book of Amos, a real cheerful book. But I think an important book for us to look at, particularly in the run-up to Easter. Um, and uh, so next week we begin in Amos. But today we finish up the series on John 17. And over the last four weeks, we've been looking at this prayer to help us understand what are the priorities of Jesus as he prays. Some of those priorities that we've looked at over the last uh, weeks are that the glory of God and the Son, in other words, the reputation of God the Father and the reputation of God the Son are very paramount to Jesus and ought to be important to us. Another theme uh, of the priority is that Jesus has been given the power to grant eternal life by grace to us. We also learned that we, sinful though we are, are the Father's gift to Jesus. We've also heard a number of times, and we'll hear it again today, is that the unity of the followers of Jesus is paramount. And that unity that we have together is based on receiving God's grace plus nothing else. That's what brings unity to God's people. Last week, as Pastor Andrew was preaching, we, we heard about the fact that God wants to give us great joy, wants us to, to enjoy and have the joy that he has, and that he is sending us out on a mission to share the good news of the gospel. All of these things are the priorities of Jesus as we looked at it. And this morning, I want us to look at two final priorities that we see from Jesus' prayer to his Father. Two final priorities that, that we need to, to, get, to grab a hold of, to get a handle on, to live out of. So let's look at the first priority, which is frankly amazing. It's really astounding. This first of the final priorities is that the glory of Jesus has been given to us. Think about that. The glory of Jesus has been given to us, the followers of Jesus. Take a look at verse 22. Jesus, again, is praying to his Father. He says, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them. And that's speaking directly to us. It's not just simply his disciples. As you realize back up in verse 20, Jesus says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So Jesus says, the glory that you've given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one. For those of us who have trusted Christ alone to save us from our sin, who have received the grace of God, the gift of God, not anything we've done or accomplished, the glory of Jesus has been given to us. Now the foundation of this glory comes from the fact that Jesus is glorified in his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. We see this in verse 1, where, where, where Jesus prays, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. In other words, the hour has come means that Jesus is about to die, to be buried, to be raised, and then to ascend to, to back to the, the, the right hand of the Father. And that glory that Jesus has because of his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension has now been placed on us. And in other words, what happened to Jesus at the cross in his resurrection and in his ascension has spiritually happened to those of us who believe in Jesus. Jesus died to sin. We died to sin in Jesus. We were buried with Christ as he was buried. As Jesus was raised to new life, we've been raised to new life 
free from sin, free from the, the guilt and power of sin. And in a very real sense, spiritually, as Jesus is ascended to the right hand of the Father, Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, we too are seated with Christ in the heavenlies, meaning that the power of the ascended Christ is available to us by the Holy Spirit who lives in us. By grace, we share in this glory, the glory of Jesus. And frankly, it is, it, it blows your mind if you think about it for more than two minutes. It really does. But it's another aspect of this first of the final priorities that the glory of Jesus has been given to us. There's, there's more to it. Take a look at verse 24. It says, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. What, what this is, seems to be suggesting is that um, Jesus desires that we, who have put our faith and confidence in Christ alone, would be where, 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 where Jesus is and that we would see his glory. Now, this certainly seems to have a reference to the future. I want you to turn to 1 John 3 uh, to get a, a little more specificity in what I think one of the things Jesus is trying to say through this. 1 John 3, verse 2. In other words, Jesus wants us to be with him, to be where he is, and to see his glory. Well, we know in the future, either after we die or after Jesus comes again to to remake this world, we're told in 1 John 3, 2 this, Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. In the future, there will come a time when we see Jesus face to face, that simply gazing on Jesus, we will be transformed and become like Jesus Christ fully free from sin and, and the judgment that accompanies sin. Is that not incredible? Does anyone here need to be more like Jesus? How many of you have spouses that need to be more like Jesus than, than you do? Please don't raise your hand. I, I'm, I'm booked up with marriage counseling this week, so is Pastor Andrew. Is that not astounding? But I think there's more than that. Yes, that is a future blessing that awaits us. But I think this vision of the glory of Jesus is something that we can have, at least in part, even right now. Turn to 2 Corinthians 3.18. Second Corinthians 3.18, Paul writes this. He says, and we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. In other words, what Paul is saying is that by the Spirit of God, even now, not, not simply in the future, but even now, we can get a glimpse of the glory of Jesus. And when we, the Spirit gives us this glimpse, when he gives us this picture, when we see it, that begins to change us into, more into the image of Jesus, even as we await the, the future full understanding of an experience of seeing Jesus and becoming like him. So while we... We'll behold Jesus in the future face to face, even now through the Holy Spirit. We can see the glory of Jesus now, and seeing the glory of Jesus now begins to transform us, even as it anticipates the ultimate transformation we await in the next life. There's another way that this prayer talks about this idea that the glory of Jesus has been given to us. So let's go back to John 17. In verse 26. 
Jesus prays, I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. This is another way to sort of describe that the glory of Jesus has been poured out on us. I mean, look at this amazing phrase. He says, I've made known to them your name. I'll continue to make it known, Jesus speaking, that the love with which you have loved me, in other words, that the love that Father God had to his Son, may be in them and I in them. In other words, what Jesus is saying here is that those who have received the gift of eternal life by faith alone in Christ alone, Jesus not only lives in us, but, but, but we are in Christ, okay? And, and, and that, and that this, this, this love that has been poured out on us is the same love that the Father has to the Son is now being poured out in us. That's amazing. That is amazing. Just remember what Jesus, uh, what, what, what God the Father said to Jesus at his baptism. When Jesus is being baptized and he's, he's basically showing that he is representing uh, us before God by, by participating in this baptism. He was sinless. He didn't need uh, the, the, the sort of the baptism. He didn't need it, but he's representing us, so to speak, to God and God to us. Father God speaks from heaven and says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. That's the love and the delight that God the Father has with the son. And that same love has now been poured out to us. I remember a, a number of years ago, it was a long time ago, I, 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 I knew a, a Princeton University student. They, were, they had just graduated. They were moving out of, uh, they were moving out of, the, of university housing. But there was a problem because they were going to partly stay for a few extra months in, in Princeton, so they had to store things. Something got messed up with the storage unit. So this student calls me up and says, I need to store some stuff. He shows up with his father, car full of stuff he's got to sto store. And I met the father for the first time. I said, hi, how are you doing? And, and the father looked at me and says, well, I guess you know my son. Hi, I'm Dave. It's not his real name. But yeah, this is my son. And then he says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased sarcastically. I think that's the way a lot of us think about what God thinks of us. I mean, what this text is saying, the glory of Jesus is on you, right? You're going to see my glory one day and be completely transformed, but even now you can see it and be transformed. And when, when, when Jesus says that the same love that Father God has for Jesus has now been poured out to us by grace, what Jesus is saying is, Father God delights in you if you know Christ. Now, I know some of you, are, I know some of you, you're thinking, that can't be true. No one laughs. You think that. He can't. I think a lot of us wake up. I think you're a lot like me. I, th I hope not. I mean, I hope, sort of. Some days, even on my best days, if I'm honest, I think God barely tolerates me. He died on the cross to save me from sin, but you know, the wrath, so the full wrath of God isn't poured out on me every day. But he barely puts up with me. Isn't that what you think sometimes, how God thinks about you? He delights in you. When he looks at you, he, he has the same love that he had for his son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's what he thinks of you if you were in Christ and Christ is in you. It's incredible. But we have a hard time believing that, don't we? I know I do. The idea that God the Father is looking down on me and delighting in me seems like a, you know, like a, it's a really nice thought, Tracy, but, ugh. but he does. 
And it's interesting, you get other pictures of this in the New Testament, that even when we are struggling, even when we are wandering away from God, God still delights in us and delights to receive us back upon our repentance. Think about the prodigal son. Prodigal son's an amazing story. Jesus tells the story. It's a story that pictures the love that God has for us. In the prodigal son, the younger son wants the inheritance now before his father dies. What he's really saying to his father is, I, since you won't seem to die like you need to, give me the money now. Very disrespectful. He goes off and spends all the money on wild, riotous living. Then he decides after he's feeding the pigs and saying, wow, the servants in my father's household do better than this. He decides to come back. And the way the text reads is that the father sees the son coming back. Now, the son hasn't said a word of repentance. He hasn't demonstrated more than 17 minutes of repentance. And yet, what does the father do? Picks up his, you know, his robe, his tunic, picks it up and begins to run to his son, which would have been very, very dishonoring for a patriarch like this to run anywhere, much less to run to his ungrateful son that wished him dead a few years ago. And he runs. And then what does the father do? Well, the son does say, say I, I've, I've sinned, and I, you know, I, I, he, he says all the right things, but he's not really demonstrated a long period of good behavior. And what does the father do? He throws apart. That's even how God delights in you when you're not having a good day. The same kind of delight and love. And, 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 and even if you've kind of wandered off the path, you make one millimeter move toward God, he's running to you. He's getting ready to throw a party for you. Of course, even in the death of Jesus, listen, the death of Jesus was a horrific event. This is, a, Jesus is fully God and fully man. He is about to take on sin upon himself, where from all eternity past, he has been in perfect communion with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. He's never known sin. He's never committed sin. And now he's contemplating in that garden that he's going to die for you and me. And he's, he's, he's sweating drops of blood. He's going into shock. Yet at the same time, the scripture tells us who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Joy. I think for a lot of us, we have a lot of difficulty really believing that when Jesus is saying here that the glory of Jesus has been put on us, we really have a hard time believing that that could possibly be true. There must be another reading of that, but it's true. And to think about what that would mean for us, if we really got up every morning and realized that the glory of Jesus has been poured out on us, when we see Jesus through the Holy Spirit, we begin to change, and one day we will be just like him, and the same love that the Father has for the Son, He has for you. If we could hold on to that, we would be so different. I mean, the next time you got criticized, it wouldn't crush you because the God of the universe loves you the same way He loves His very own Son, Jesus Christ. You would deal with rejection very differently. The fact that you're rejected by someone you deeply love, but the God of the universe loves you and has set his love on you. The very same love just as he poured out on his perfectly righteous son, Jesus Christ. Trials would not overwhelm us. Why? Because we know that one day soon we are going to see Jesus and we will be like him. And even now, we, by the Holy Spirit, we get glimpses of this Jesus, and it changes us. Failure would not unnerve us, because God loves us with the same love that he loves his own dear son. Even sin. 
could not overwhelm us because we know we have a God that when he looks at us, for those of us who know Christ, he doesn't see all of the sin. He sees the sin, of course, but fundamentally, when he looks at us, he sees the beauty and glory and splendor of Jesus who died in our place. We got to believe that. That's the first of the final priorities. There's a second priority, second of the final priorities that Jesus mentioned in this prayer. It's mentioned a couple of times. Let me show you where it's mentioned and then uh, describe what it is. In verse 21, Jesus says that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. He says it again in the very next verse, the glory that you have given me, I've given to them that they may be one, even as we are one. The second of the final priorities is this, the followers of Jesus should experience unity so that the world will know about the reality of God. This is what Jesus is praying about. This is sort of the last prayer before... Well, he does have a prayer in the garden. Take this cup away, but not my will but thine. But one of his last prayers that show what he's really concerned about. That we would experience unity so that the world outside would know God himself. Now, I think it's important to understand what this means and what it doesn't mean. What this doesn't mean in, in terms of we will be one is that we will all agree on all issues together. You know that can't be right. Look at your neighbor. They don't agree with you on all kinds of things. It's not that there's some uniformity here. It, it, it's not also that, she, I, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm paranoid about this. I've seen preachers preach this thing and basically say, nobody can disagree with the leadership. Now, I wish you would do that, but that's not what it's saying, okay? It's not what it's saying. You can disagree. You can write me an email this afternoon. I'll listen to it. I'll respond to it. The elders are human beings. They, we don't always make the right decisions. We, that is not what this is saying, is that everybody has this servile uh, sort of, you know, uh, you know, submission to the authorities. That's not what this is talking about. It also doesn't mean that we, we agree on other more extraneous issues, that, that, that that's, unity is important. No. In other words, in the church of Jesus Christ, we don't all have to agree and vote the same way every two years, every four years. That's not what it's talking about. I have heard of so many churches as well. They have all kinds of division about music. That's not the basis of our unity. And at Stonehill, we purposely force you to be unhappy with the worship. Because we sing hymns, but we don't sing all hymns. We sing contemporary music, but not all contemporary music. We have choirs. We'll have a children's choir in a couple weeks. We, we, we recite the Nicene Creed. We, 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 we don't structure the worship service so that we all agree with it. Frankly, I wish there was more brass every week. <laughs> but there's not. It's a shame. Because the unity that Jesus is talking about is not a unity based on our political uh, positions. It's not our unity based on music. It's, it's not a unity based on the fact that we agree with everything that is happening at, at all times. The unity that Jesus is talking about is based on one thing, and that is that the glory of Jesus Christ has been poured out on us. And if it's been poured out on you, it's been poured out on the person who's seated next to you in the pew. That's what brings unity. The unity that we have is because of Jesus. Because Jesus has saved us by grace. And that is why we can have unity. We don't all have to be the same age, thankfully. 
two weeks ago was one of the greatest moments in my ever as a pastor. I was getting ready to pronounce the benediction, the final hymn was going on, and a little, I don't know, two-year-old kid ran right down the aisle. Thought he was going to go see his dad who was playing the organ. Then he takes a left, he goes all the way over to the drums, he starts playing the drums while I'm trying to pronounce the benediction. That was the best part of that sermon two weeks ago. You know why I love that? Because it shows we're a multi-generational church. And there's going to be kids who run amok a little bit. I'd rather have kids run amok than adults running amok. <laughs> I'd rather have kids crying out a little bit and making some noise than watching some of you who fall asleep. I know who you are. I pray for you. I also refuse to look at you because it hurts my psyche. We're a multi-generational church. We ought to be a church where socioeconomic issues are not paramount because that's not what brings us together. It's not our educational attainment or lack of attainment. Those are interesting facts about you, and as we get to know you, we will come to know that. But that is not what brings us together as God's people. Ethnicity is no barrier to the church coming together as one. It can't be. I just want to give you an encouragement, but also a challenge in this area. I've had a number of people in town who, uh, who know me, and, and as a courtesy, they came to church. They're, they're not necessarily believers, but they wanted to see what was going on at Stonehill Church. I have said a lot of nice things about you. Kind of. No, I did. They came to the church and, and, and they, 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 they witnessed the worship service. And of course, I was all interested as, as the worship service closed up, you know, and, and as I talked to them later, I said, what did you think about the church? I was kind of hoping they would say, never heard a sermon like that. Nobody said that. Nobody said much about the music because they didn't know the songs. Some people mentioned the, the, the church, right, the building. I thought it was very nice. But the thing that everyone said of my friends who don't normally go to church is, I am shocked at the diversity in your church. Now that's good news. But I want to challenge us. It's not simply that there's diversity that come. We, we are supposed to be one. We, we have this, this, this Jesus' passion here, is that the followers of Jesus would be one, meaning that we, 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 we are joined together and we're fellowshipping and we're in communion. And that communion is reflective of the communion that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have together in the Godhead in the Trinity. They have been communing together for all eternity. And they invite us to commune with them, but they also want our communion to, to reflect their communion. Which requires an intimacy of knowledge, an understanding of one another, particularly understanding the diversity in this church so that we can have the unity that's based on Jesus Christ. And that takes work. That takes effort. That takes time. I encourage you to take those steps of particularly meeting people who aren't the same age of you, who don't have the same education that you do, that, that are different ethnicity than you, because the reality is, folks, what we're supposed to be about is a picture of the future when all people from every tribe and people group and nation and come together around the Lamb to worship Him. And we are supposed to be a people that is giving the world a preview of coming attractions. And this kind of unity is not superficial. It's substantive. It's supposed to mirror the relationships that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have together. Which means we have to learn and grow in the love that we have for one another. There's a real sense in which since Jesus, <laughs> since God delights in Jesus, 
And that same love of God the Father that he delights in Jesus is now poured on us. There's a real sense in, in, in the fact that we ought to delight in one another because of the gospel. We can't just tolerate each other. That's not the goal. And this is challenging because in the love relationships of the Trinity, there, there, there's, a, there's a mutuality there because Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are God in and of themselves, but together as one God, they are God. But, but there's, there's a mutuality. And we have to have the same kind of mutuality with one another that reflects that mutuality. And so half-hearted attempts at love just aren't going to cut it. I suspect when we talk about mutuality, it's, it's, it's not fun. I'm sure you've had this experience where you really like someone and you really want to spend time with them, but you get the clear impression they don't really want to spend that much time with you. Is that not awful? I have a list of people. No, 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 no. But it's also awful if, 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 you, if, if, if someone in your life seems like they want to spend a lot of time with you and you, you can barely take it. That's not fun either. There's a mutuality of love and we'll have to grow in it. In fact, the text there seems to indicate that we need to grow in that love. And of course, all of this love is supposed to ultimately show the world what the reality of God is like in the way we relate to one another. So let me, I want you to bow in prayer. I want you to join me in prayer. I'm, I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. A couple of things that I think we need to respond to God through this text. And dear Father in heaven, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, we would come to understand that the love you had for your son, Jesus, is the same love you pour out on us for those of us who've trusted Christ alone. And I pray that we would believe with more consistency and more regularity that because of Jesus, you delight in us. You delight in us. We are your beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. You delight in us because of Jesus. The glory of Jesus is on us. One day we're going to be just like Christ when we, when we see Jesus face to face. But even now we get glimpses through your word by the power of the Holy Spirit of what, who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And it starts to transform us even now. Help us to believe that about ourselves, Lord. But I also pray that you would help us to believe it about everyone around us in Stone Hill. They, too, are people that God delights in because of Jesus. They, too, have been, the glory of Jesus has been poured out on them. And we would view them in that context, and that would pull us together in a mutuality of love that shows the world what you're like. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Help us to that end, I pray in Jesus' name.